grace to you and peace from God, our Creator and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Along with Amy, Bill, who are here with me, we heartily welcome you to the service of worship recorded at Central Sanit United Church. As you know, worship is the center of our lives as a faith community. And worship is a time when we gather together joined as one in our common faith, in our shared ministries, and in our communion with God's Spirit among us. Now, I know we're still three weeks away from being at worship together in person. That's exciting. And we're going to be together, hopefully, on October 4th. But we are still together today, all the same in spirit, in our ongoing care for one another, and in our being the body of Christ in this place and in this time. And if you are a visitor participating in this online service, know that you, too, are most welcome and just as much a part of us because you are a beloved child of God as well, a sister or brother in the faith. I commend to all of you uh, your reading of the announcements sent out to you earlier this week. Just another word about our uh, gathering, which we're hoping will begin on October 4th. Uh, there will be, um, uh, you will receive further news in the next couple of weeks of how that's going to play out in terms of making sure that we're safe. And we're thinking probably of two services, hopefully both on Sunday. So stay tuned. Uh, and now, as is our custom, we acknowledge that the traditional territory in which we gather for worship is that of the Coast Salish First Nations. May we have respect for the land and live in peace and friendship with all its peoples. May this spark of divine energy be a beacon of hope to all. We welcome Christ in our midst to brighten and ground our worship. Our opening hymn today is at Voices United 326. <laughs> this day, some with joyful hearts and some with hurting souls. Christ is here, ready to celebrate, ready to heal. We come to worship this day, some of us tired, some of us full of energy. Christ is here, giving us strength, giving us purpose. We come to worship this day, some righteous, some repentant. Christ is here, full of grace, full of forgiveness. We come to worship this day, some of us full of questions, some of us sure in our faith. Christ is here, present in doubt, present in assurance. We come to worship this day, seeking divine presence. We proclaim that Christ is here. Let us pray. Fit us, O God, for this new day. Through your Spirit, grant us courage so that today's uncertainties may not overwhelm us. Through your Christ, fill us with love, so that differences may not divide us. Through your creative energy, make us new, so that the past may not enslave us. Spirit, Christ, Creator, lead us into newness of life. Be with us in this time of worship, and send us forth into the future with hope and courage. 
Amen. And again from Voices United at 581. Let us pray. Gracious God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scripture is read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear what you are saying to us today. Amen. The Gospel reading features a parable of Jesus that considers one of the fundamental characteristics of the Christian faith, that of forgiveness. Reading from the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 18. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, Jesus replied, seventy times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who had decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay. So the king ordered that he, his spouse, his children, everything he had be sold to pay the debt. But the man fell down before the king and begged him, Oh, sir, be patient with me and I will pay it all. And the king was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and jailed until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him what had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you for that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? And the angry king sent the man to prison until he had paid every penny. That's what God will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters in your heart. May God bless our understanding of this reading from the Holy Scriptures. And from the world around us, some short quotes on forgiveness. Forgiveness has nothing to do with absolving a criminal of his crime. It has everything to do with relieving oneself of the burden of being a victim, letting go of the pain, 
Transforming Oneself from Victim to Survivor by C.R. Strong. When you hold resentment towards another, you are bound to that person or condition by an emotional link that is stronger than steel. Forgiveness is the only way to dissolve that link and get free by Catherine Ponder. Forgiving does not erase the bitter past. A healed memory is not a deleted memory. Instead, forgiving what we cannot forget creates a new way to remember. We change the memory of our past into a hope for our future by Louis B. Smees. Forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it by Mark Twain. Forgiveness is not an occasional act. It is a constant attitude by Martin Luther King, Jr. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Renowned scholar Huston Smith gave lectures in which he talked about the religions of the world. He would cite one or two aspects of each religion that made it unique. He noted that in Islam, the faith penetrated all aspects of life. In Hinduism, Smith admired the largeness and complexity of the faith, the way in which it attempts to embrace all of reality. In Buddhism, he noted the depth of its spirituality and the desire to be in complete harmony with creation and therefore with the Creator. In Christianity, Smith chose forgiveness. Forgiveness, he says, is Christianity's unusual claim. Jesus dies forgiving those who killed him. Forgiveness is what Jesus demanded of his followers. In the gospel stories, Jesus is constantly depicted as saying, your sins are forgiven. Our gospel reading today is about forgiveness. Now, personally speaking, I find this passage to be a, a challenging one. I find what it has to say both appealing and at the same time disconcerting. I mean, are we really always supposed to be forgiving? Aren't there situations where forgiveness is nigh impossible? What about those things people do that are just so heinous that to forgive seems just downright wrong, unjust? And what does Jesus mean when he says we are to forgive 70 times 7? Perhaps you would agree with me that saying those words, I forgive you, can sometimes be among the most difficult words that we can say. And I don't mean the occasional, uh, the occasional moment of warm-hearted forgiveness, overlooking someone's minor slight when we're feeling magnanimous. Nor do I mean the spontaneous forgiveness we feel when someone is genuinely contrite over some accidental and again, usually minor fault. What I mean are those things that are really, really hurtful. Those times when the person seems disinclined to take responsibility, let alone apologize. Those episodes that continue to wound each time we remember them. Those words or deeds that have marked us deeply and painfully and feel like they'll never go away. Those are the things that are so incredibly hard to forgive. For instance, think of someone who has been the victim of domestic violence. His or her partner has made life miserable, betrayed their marriage vows with violent acts. Is the spouse subjected to such abuse expected to forgive, as the saying goes, forgive and forget? Think for a moment of the worst thing that someone has ever done to you. Now picture yourself extending the hand of forgiveness, saying the words, I forgive you. The fact is, forgiveness may be the toughest act we Christians are asked to do. So it is that this passage of Scripture in Matthew may be so very problematic for many of us. So let's consider it more closely. 
Peter asks Jesus how many times he should forgive someone and then wonders aloud if forgiving seven times would be an adequate limit. Peter thinks he's being generous, like super generous, when he wonders if he should forgive up to seven times. The religious custom of the day, after all, was to forgive up to three times, and then punishment would befall the individual were he or she to sin a fourth time. Peter not only doubles this traditional number, but he adds one to it, perhaps knowing that seven is considered the perfect number and the number associated with God. Good old Peter, always going that extra mile to please Jesus. In response to the seemingly logical question, Jesus throws out an answer variously translated as 77 or 70 times seven. Like so many of us who follow Jesus, Peter just wants to know what he's supposed to do. That, Jesus points out, is not the question he should be asking. And to illustrate the point, Jesus tells a parable. In the parable, the king is owed 10,000 talents. In our translation today, millions of dollars. It sounds like a lot, doesn't it? In fact, it's an impossibly, astronomically absurd lot. A single talent was the equivalent of 15 years worth of wages in first century Palestine. The amount this servant owes is the equivalent of 150,000 years worth of income. The folks first hearing this parable would have burst out laughing at such a comically high amount. And of course, the servant can't possibly pay it. And the servant begs the king to forgive the debt, and in fact, the king does. But then the same servant runs into someone who owes him the equivalent of a few months' wages, Compared to what he owed the king, the amount was minuscule. And when the king hears that the first servant refused to forgive the second servant, the forgiving king was outraged and consequently reneges on his offer of forgiveness. And because the servant does not show mercy as he did, the servant is now sent away to be punished. To Peter and other folks who think that faith is about doing what we are supposed to do, Jesus offers another reality. Stop asking questions like how much I should forgive. Because one who is counting the number of times he or she says, yeah, you're forgiven, isn't actually forgiving anyone at all. Furthermore, the parable isn't saying that we should just keep going on forgiving and forgiving without even thinking about it. After all, how can our heart really be in it if we just keep hitting that forgive button up to the prescribed limit? The entire exchange with Peter and subsequent parable are part of an invitation into a new way of being, not simply a way of following some social custom or religious rule. Peter's misguided question, however, is still often our question. How many times do I need to forgive that person who keeps on offending me? How much forgiveness is enough? What is the limit of forgiveness? Yes, Peter's question is still our question. But I think that deep down we know the answer to that question. For forgiveness is the hallmark of what it is to live as followers of the one who is all forgiving. Jesus is saying that we are to aim at forgiving often and completely, as often and completely as it takes. Oh yes, I have heard or even voiced myself arguments against this idea. For I know there are those who are unrepentant, who perpetually offend and take no responsibility for their hurtful words or hurtful actions. And I have certainly heard the wrenching stories of those whose abusers held this requirement to forgive over their heads. And even well-meaning people, including Christian clergy, have upheld and interpreted these words of Jesus in such a perverse way as to ensure victims remain victims. And I know that Jesus would have some choice words for those who would twist the goodness of what is offered here into a servant of evil itself. Notwithstanding all the arguments we, must, we might muster with respect to the matter of forgiving or not forgiving, we still return to this. To follow the one who forgives us means we are to be people of forgiveness. I have observed Christ-like forgiveness in those who have every reason not to forgive. 
the ability to somehow let go and move beyond, sometimes even speak words of forgiveness to those who have not even asked for it, who surely may not deserve it, and in so doing to somehow set themselves free. Presbyterian minister and author Marjorie Thompson writes, quote, to forgive is to make a conscious choice to release the person who has wounded us from the sentence of our judgment, however justified that judgment may be. It represents a choice to leave behind our resentment and desire for retribution, however fair such punishment may seem. Forgiveness involves excusing persons from the punitive consequences they deserve because of their behavior. The behavior remains condemned, but the offender is released from its effects as far as the forgiver is concerned. Forgiveness means the power of the original wound to hold us trapped is broken." End of quote. Another writes about forgiveness this way, Forgiveness isn't for the other person, it's for me. She goes on, I was married to a man who abused me. Forgiveness doesn't remove the consequences of his sinful behavior. After all, I finally left him and am now divorced. She continues, in 1981, Pope John Paul II was shot. And Pope John forgave the shooter, but the shooter still went to prison. And this writer tells of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission where people forgave unspeakable crimes. I saw an old woman tell the murderer of her son how much pain he had caused her. And then she adopted the young man. That is the power of forgiveness. If I don't forgive, then the things done to me are a present reality. I am a victim. The other person controls my life, calls the shots, clip my wings. I will be a sick person. But I refuse to be a victim. The only way to escape being a victim is to forgive. Flush it down the toilet. The author concludes, Yes, sometimes I am tempted to dwell on those things from the past. Yes, sometimes I have nightmares. But I refuse to dwell on that stuff. I didn't go to the perpetrator and say, I forgive you. He didn't even think that he was doing anything wrong. It doesn't matter. I have chosen to forgive, to let go, to move on, and to be a healthy person. Forgiveness sets me free." End of quote. There are so many levels of complexity to forgiveness. I think of a woman who told me how she tenderly washed her father's hair while he lay dying, how she provided loving care and comfort to him in his final days. This same father who had sexually abused her over many years as a child. At one level, by such caring action, she has forgiven him. And yet at another level, she continues to seek to forgive, to let go, to heal, to move on. In Jesus' parable, the king is so extravagant in his forgiveness, it is way beyond our comprehension. And it makes me think that perhaps it isn't help for us, helpful for us to imagine that we can forgive like the king forgives. Most of us, perhaps all of us, could never aspire to that kind of complete and utter forgiveness anyway. I don't have to identify, and I don't identify with the king in the story, but I can and I do identify with the servant who had the massive debt who has been forgiven so, so much. Which means my first job isn't to assume or insist I must forgive incalculable debts or massive wrongdoings, but simply bask in the amazing forgiveness, acceptance, and grace that I have experienced and try as much as I can to live out of that. The failure of the first servant isn't simply that he won't forgive the other servant but that he has just experienced an utterly unexpected, completely beyond his wildest dreams, life-changing moment of grace, and seems absolutely untouched by it. And for this reason, he lives devoid of any sense of joyful gratitude. His whole life changed, and he didn't even notice. 
One final story that demonstrates this appreciation for being forgiven that can change our lives for the better. Mahatma Gandhi was raised in a strict Hindu home. The family did not eat meat, they did not drink alcohol, they didn't smoke tobacco. As a teenager, Gandhi saw British soldiers with broad shoulders and hairy chests and wondered if eating meat, drinking, and smoking would make him broad-shouldered and hairy. From age 15, Gandhi was the paymaster in his father's business, and even though he knew that the employees were poor and had difficulty buying even rice for their families, he juggled the books and stole from their accounts to buy himself liquor and cigarettes. And as one deception often leads to another, he then stole some of his brother's gold to buy meat. Gandhi's mother suspected something, but when she confronted her son, he lied to her. Stealing and lying being two of the worst sins in Hinduism, Gandhi began to feel the pains of remorse. In emotional agony, finally, he couldn't stand it any longer. He wrote a letter of confession in which he said he was sorry, would never do any of these things again, and would accept whatever punishment his father deemed appropriate. He fully expected his father would fire him from his job as paymaster and perhaps even banish him from the family. Gandhi took the letter to his father, who was ill in bed, and waited while he read it. When he finished, Gandhi's father looked up, and with tears rolling down his cheeks, ripped up the letter and handed the pieces back to his son. Gandhi said that experience changed his life. It taught him the power of forgiveness. Because of his father's unconditional love, Mahatma Gandhi devoted his life to reconciliation, forgiveness, and peace. He called it satagrayaha, or soul force. Christians call it grace. It's not about arithmetic. It's not about rules or traditions or custom. It's not about what we are supposed to do. It's about a way of life. It's about a way of relating habitually to one another and to the world. It's seeing one another despite all our faults, all our shortcomings, all our sinfulness as God sees us, not as people who deserve necessarily to be forgiven, but as people so deeply loved that God can only but forgive us. We are not God. We cannot aspire to so completely and constantly forgive as God does. But knowing God as we do through Jesus, we seek to be forgiving people as best we can. And as much as we can and do forgive, may our forgiveness be grounded in the love and forgiveness God has shown us. Thanks and praise be to God.